So we're here again with Professor Bernard Haeckel of Princeton University, continuing our discussion on what to be done about Yemen. You were very clear that you don't think this should be a U.S. military solution. Yeah. Why not? Well, principally because America does not have the staying power to militarily defeat al-Qaeda. And any attack that America uh, makes or does there fits into the al-Qaeda narrative. And we can see this just from the recent attacks. Can I ask you something counterintuitive? If you thought America did have the staying power, and if it combined bombs with books, so to speak, guns and butter, military and development, would that be good? See, the problem for, for America is that its local partner is the Yemeni government. And the Yemeni government is seen, I mean, universally by Yemenis as corrupt, um, uh, brutal. Um, and therefore, it's a, America's association with it confirms al-Qaeda's view that America is only there to support corrupt, brutal regimes because they're there to exploit some resources that the Yemenis or Muslims have. So, you know, anything that America touches at the moment in the Middle East, it has, whether in Yemen or elsewhere, is just immediately polluted. You think, though, that the Gulf countries, that Saudi Arabia and others should be dealing with it. What evidence is there that they can? Well, the fact that they crushed al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia is already a big, um, I think, a, a very good thing and a good lesson to, to be had, and a lesson that America can benefit from, by the way. And it involves a combination of, 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 of tools. One is brute force and intelligence, certainly, and security um, type activities, but also propaganda and money. They buy people off. They marry some of these jihadis off to, to, to they, they settle them down. They give them jobs. They give them cars. So there's this kind of personal, intimate, um, this is a domestic problem, not an international problem. Part of the problem with the United States is that it always sees the problem of al-Qaeda as the problem of the other, of the outsider. Whereas the Saudis think of it as the problem of the insider. And that gives you an entirely different way of, of looking at the problem. Just a, qu a final question before our producer Samuel Burke has some uh, of our web questions. You know, like Pakistan had to be brought on site to consider the Taliban threat a threat to themselves. Right. Does Yemen believe that? Does the, does the rest of the region believe that? Well, the problem with al-Qaeda in Yemen is that it consists of at least two groups. You have the older generation fighters who are basically people with whom the Yemeni government has struck a deal. Essentially, the deal is, you go and attack people outside Yemen, you don't cause problems domestically, you can be based here, we'll leave you alone. The younger generation, the guys who have come back from Iraq and Pakistan more recently, are much more radical, much less principled, and uh, will not strike a deal with the government to contain their attacks to outside the country. And so this younger generation, of the, that's emerged only in the last two or three years, um, cannot, cannot be brought to heel by the Yemeni government. Samuel? So we took some questions from Facebook and Twitter users, and the first one, Eugene said via Twitter, what does the professor see as the most important step in getting closer cooperation between U.S. and Yemeni anti-terror forces? Uh, I think that cooperation, by the way, exists and has existed very strongly since 2000 when the, coal, the USS Cole was bombed. Again, I don't think the solution lies with better cooperation. Um, when it comes to al-Qaeda. It is something that the Yemenis, and only the Yemenis, in association with the regional uh, neighbors, other Muslims, basically, uh, and other Arabs, can deal with this problem much more effectively. Okay, our next question is from a Facebook user, Daniel Weaver, who's in Longview, Texas, and he asked the professor, to what degree do the, do the problems in Yemen stem from tribal conflict and loyalty? There are definitely uh, very strong tribes in Yemen who oppose the writ of the central government. And some of them harbor al-Qaeda um, members. But the tribes are not in and of themselves a problem because one of the reasons that I quite like the tribes of Yemen, for example, is that they've prevented a fairly brutal and corrupt man from taking over the country and turning Yemen into something like Egypt or uh, in Iraq under Saddam. So the tribes have actually been a domestic force, armed, preventing a totalitarian regime from fully taking over the country. But yet, just as you go to another question, there are people who complain about the corruption and the, the, to the totality of power, but they also say that this is the only person who could have kept the country together and not seen it split apart. 
Well, that's a self-serving argument that the president uses. No, but some Yemenis say that. Yeah, per- perhaps. I mean, it's di- it's it's a counterfactual. You know, I mean, it's difficult to prove something. Uh, you know, when you don't have an alternative, and especially since he will not allow an alternative to emerge to to, to his kind of rule. Okay, one of our Twitter followers named Spookster says. Why is it that Yemen is unable to control its own security without getting forces from other countries? Well, that, that's an excellent question. And, and the reason that it cannot control its own security is because, A, the population has about 60 million weapons, individual pieces of, of weaponry. So it's a highly armed uh, society. Uh, but on top of that, a lot of the social services are not available to the population. And so this, the writ of the central government and the, prov- the provisions that the central government ought to be giving are, are not there. And so you constantly have rebellions against the central government over s- issues like, you promised us a water well, why haven't you dug it? You promised us a school, why haven't you built it? Go ahead, Barkley. I, um, if I may ask, your um, point that the problem of al-Qaeda in Yemen uh, it should be a regional problem and, and a regional solution is well taken that Saudi Arabia and Qatar and other governments should step in. But if they haven't had the political will to do so until now, will they now? Is the will there? Have events created enough pressure for that will to, to be generated? Or will it not happen? Well, you know, part of the problem in the Middle East, and especially in the Gulf region, is that a lot of the politics are personal. And so let's take the example of Saudi Arabia. You have a man who basically controls the portfolio of Yemen, Saudi policy towards Yemen. He's the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and he's been very ill in the last two, three years. So he's basically abandoned that portfolio, and the Saudis haven't had a policy on Yemen because of that personal issue that he has. Now, hopefully, you know, the system will address the problem because it is a very acute problem in Yemen. But that can only happen if someone else takes over that portfolio. George Lerner? Uh, Professor, we're talking about about deep ingrained problems in in Yemen, Um, but it wasn't always this way. In the early 90s, there was a flowering of what you might call democracy. There were, I think, I believe about 40 political parties, 130 newspapers. Um, That all ended when President Saleh um, uh, engaged or or there was a a, a further outcropping of of civil war. What happened to, to... to drag this process out so that we did not see the kind of democracy that many people had hoped in Yemen. And what is the answer? What is the possible resolution for for Yemen on the political stage? Well, one of the reasons why we saw a retreat uh, in terms of political parties and newspapers and democracy was that in the 1990s, Yemen became quite affluent with oil. So the president had enough resources from oil revenues not to need to build a consensus for his rule. So he could buy off opposition and he could silence uh, people through through these revenues. And now that the revenues have uh, been se- severely re- uh, re- reduced, he's now seeing himself, you know, facing a lot of opposition in the country. Um, the solution, though, is really for the system itself to reform itself completely, away from a one-man uh, rule to something closer to, you know, a parliamentary democracy, which is what Yemen ought to be as a republic. I just circle back on the business of the regional solution. If no one in Saudi Arabia is taking over the portfolio, yes. and there hasn't been the will among countries like Qatar, is that actually a viable solution? Is there enough growing momentum or pressure to to create a solution there? Right. Or is that really not going to happen? And the only alternative will be, as right. you said, replaying the same old model with the U.S. doing strikes. Right. Well, this is exactly uh, where the U.S. role can be critical because the U.S. can actually put considerable pressure on the Saudis and on the Gulf regimes to to address the Yemeni problem. Rather than going after Yemen militarily, I think the the U.S. must engage the regional actors to prevent Yemen from becoming a Somalia. And what's the U.S. leverage over those countries to make them do anything? It's huge. I mean, the U.S. basically protects all these regimes. Yeah. It so is absolutely huge. Yeah, I, I think so, and that's where I think the the attention should be should be focused. One thing we haven't really discussed, but it's vital, is that you mentioned these programs, for instance, in Saudi Arabia. I mean, some of these Yemeni uh, Al Qaeda types now have escaped from from prison with yeah. the 
aiding and abetting from inside yes. Yemen. One of them came from one of the Saudi uh, yeah. rehabilitation yes. programs that have been being released from Guantanamo. Yeah. So there's that issue as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, this, this points to the fact that, that the problem of Al-Qaeda does not have a silver bullet solution. It's a problem that needs to be managed. And it's one that I think neither the states and the region, nor the U.S. for that matter, can ultimately resolve. It is a long-term problem that can only be resolved if and when Muslim societies decide that this kind of violence is unacceptable to them and therefore will cut off all support. It's a big if. Yeah. It is a big if. <laughs> On that note. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Haykal, for joining Thanks. us.